Welcome to my talk on dealing with growth and how inner source practices can help you with that. Collaboration is a lot of fun, but the bigger your organization gets, the, trigger it, the more tricky it becomes. The open source ecosystem itself is a huge ecosystem. So there's a combination of loose, loosely coupled teams, but also tightly coupled teams. And all of us here um, who are using open source are part of that bigger network. Now, in addition to using open source software, we can also use their collaboration practices in order to um, scale equally. Who am I? My name is Isabel Rost from. I am open source strategist at Europace AG. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and I'm a co-founder co of two conferences. One is Berlin Buzzwords, which focuses on growth and scalability, but in terms of technology, think streaming, think data analytics, think machine learning. But I'm also co-founder of Fast Backstage, which looks at the patterns according to which open source projects um, work internally. Think economic challenges, um, community growth, um, community management, but also um, getting people into those projects. Okay, let's dive right into the challenge. As a first step, let's look at the ideal team. It's focused, it's motivated, it's challenged. What does such, what does such a team look like? Wisdom has it that those teams are pizza-sized, they are not too big but also not too small, and they work towards a very clear purpose. Ideally, that team itself is striving to improve itself. It uses retrospectives in order to improve their way of working. It uses refactorings and optimizations in order to improve technical work, but there's also time for learning and improvement in order to become better on a personal level. In an ideal world, this team is autonomous. It's independent. It can move independently of others. It doesn't have to wait for another team to get something done, and it's driven through internal motivation. So much for an ideal world. As much as this Lego brick looks easy and simple, reality often isn't quite as simple. D despite best efforts. There are dependencies that you cannot break. So sooner or later you will run into an issue where you yourself have to make changes to a dependency that you have in your project and you will have to talk to the other team. But this also enables you to become part of something bigger. So instead of just building simple blocks, what you do is to assemb assemble something larger and bigger, so that takes coordination. There are a few challenges, so. so what are the typical challenges of scaling a team? The challenges that I came across are related, for instance, to onboarding. New team mem members need to be onboarded. They need to learn the technology, but they also need to learn team culture. And a lot of what they have to learn hasn't been written down anywhere. So they do that in a pairing fashion in a lot of face-to-face -face communication. Another challenge that you face when you scale your team up is communication overload. Face-to-face -face communication after a certain team size doesn't scale anymore. Also, meetings don't scale anymore. And one-to-one -one email doesn't scale anymore as well. Anyone of you ever been part of a um, carbon copy storm where someone sends an email to five people, you add another ten people, and then at some point it's just impossible to follow the flow of the discussion anymore. So essentially nobody reads those emails anymore, right? With that communication overload comes a um, challenge which is called commun uh, communication issues towards communicating your goals. You have to pull all of your people together in order to, watch, to work towards one, co one goal. In a tiny startup that's easy because Likely you're in the same um, office space or you're just a handful of people who know your vision very well. As soon as your team becomes bigger, that becomes more tricky. As you grow your teams, you will also have to spread common values. You will have to avoid a us versus them 
um, culture in your organization, but you want all of those teams to work towards one goal instead of fighting each other. You want to avoid factions in your organizations. Also, you want to grow your teams from within. Instead of hiring from external sources into management roles, it's typically easier to grow your team members because they already know the, the structure, they already know the, um, the culture of your organization, and they already have street credibility with existing team members. So, however, for those people, you have to give them smaller steps in order to become uh, accustomed to a leadership role. So essentially what you want is to make mentorship and mentoring part of everyday life. And last but not least, what I mentioned before, you have to deal with dependencies. As much as in an agile setting we would like to do to work in a setting where you cut all dependencies down, this is not possible in all instances, so you will have to find a way to deal with these dependencies. Let's dig deeper into the dependencies. So let's start with the easy technical issues. You start out with your software project, it does have a few dependencies. However, in reality, this is not a technical dependency, it's a dependency between different teams. So how do you um, work with making modifications to components that belongs to a different team? You can wait for fixes to be made. It may take a long time. It makes you feel more dependent on the others. It hinders your autonomy. It stops your mastery you can go ahead and cut those dependencies. But now suddenly you have to do a lot of duplication and it becomes harder to focus on your business case if you have to reinvent the wheel over and over. Inosus comes to the rescue and offering you a middle path where you can help offer a helping hand to the, to the teams that you depend on. So you can focus on your purpose but you still have the autonomy to make fixes if you need them. Plus, you get a certain sense of mastery for your people because they suddenly become able to move be beyond their own team in order to make fixes and to bring learnings from the other team back. Now, doesn't that kind of sort of lead to chaos if everyone's helping everywhere? Inosos is there in order to prevent that chaos. It gives you a vocabulary in order to discuss what's going on. It gives you a vocabulary to discuss typical growth issues, and this helps you to communicate what you are trying to do. What is Inosos? As we've learned before during the Inosos Summit, it's inspired by open source. What it does is to bring open source collaboration best practices into corporations. Of course, what that means is that your team members become accustomed to working in an open source way. It also means that you're lowering the barrier in order for your team members to become active in re regular open source projects. So what's underneath all of that? At Apache, we once did a survey we, where people were asked what the Apache way of software development meant to them. And one quote that I like very much is the quote gaining by sharing. So essentially you pool all your um, people that you have together in order to achieve something that one team alone wouldn't be able to, to achieve. How does that work? What's the fundamental basics basis for that? It's open collaboration. It's not only the open source license, and it's not only releasing software under an open source license, but it's also making collaboration open. That means you have clear role definitions, you have clear governance rules, and you have transparent, transparent communication and collaboration, so that anyone watching this project can become active himself. So how do we carry that over to corporations in another source. We also have clear role definitions. What we have is trusted committers. They are the ones responsible for a project, not only for the technical side, but also for project oversight, also for mentoring new people coming to the project to become active and to grow into leadership roles. So to summarize, what trusted committers do is they mentor and enable new contributors 
in turn they set the house rules uh, they set project direction so instead of defining one way of working for the entire organization you give teams a certain uh, level of autonomy in order to define how they want to work together what you expect them to do is to communicate openly and transparently so that everyone watching that project knows what's going on what's important is that this role is filled voluntarily it's an invitation instead of an assignment trusted committers are being complemented by contributors who work in order to get something achieved, something done for their own purpose within the inner source project. So what are important aspects of inner source projects? One is communication. What are communication patterns? You want to work openly, you want to work transparently. What does that mean? It means that you take all the decisions where everyone can participate. You focus on transparency. Now, if your team grows, and if one-on-one -on -one communication doesn't work anymore, and if meetings doesn't, don't work anymore, what does scale? What scales is what scales in open source as well. You move towards um, written communication, but not in a one-to-one -on -one email setting, but in a way where you have one archive and one communication channel for each project. What's Every decision that is to be made is to be made on that one communication channel. Um, every decision and the path towards that decision is being archived, and that archive is searchable, and you can link to all of the messages. In addition, there is plain documentation. Think about creating a README document where you write down your mission statement so that everyone knows what your project is about. You write down people who is involved with it, plus you make transparent which communication channels you use. Think about using issue trackers or mailing lists for discussion and decision making. All of the communication still has to be archived and searchable, but you also make transparent where your project communicates. This gives you the autonomy to decide where and how you want to communicate. So how about that house rule settings that trusted committers are allowed to do? How does that work? Essentially, it works in a way that a contributor coming to an InnoSys project accepts that this is the house of the trusted committers. Trusted committers, in turn, make transparent how the house is supposed to be used. They write that down in the contributing document. So everything that's important gets written down there. Changes can be made through pull requests so that the entire community can participate in, in that change without being in one meeting room. What do you write down there? It's stuff related to culture, stuff related to how you want to collaborate, where do you want to discuss, where do we, where and how do you want to make dis decisions. Plus it's stuff that's related to standards. What you also want is to for people to share work in progress early. Why? It en enables people to get early feedback. It makes it transparent what everyone is working on and to working towards. However, it also needs a lot of trust. If there is someone um, pulling people down for making mistakes, mm -hmm. that doesn't help people to share progress early on. So you want to ask yourself, is failure something that you would celebrate? So how does it help me to scale Teams really? Remember the challenges that we had? In order to solve a lot of the growth challenges, what you need to instill in people is something called motivation. Something that I learned like 10 years ago in a YouTube video by the author of the author of the book Drive was that you can have extrinsic motivators. That's money, that's a bonus, that's better tooling. But what's lasting longer is intrinsic motivation. So what's intrinsic motivation? Intrinsic is someone feels a purpose that he's working towards. Someone can master um, new skills that she wants to improve. And someone feels autonomous in their decision-making process and in how they do their own work. Now let's bring that together to the growth challenges. Think about onboarding. Onboarding in an InnoSource process, project is a continuous process because every new contributor that com comes in has to be mentored again. So you um, instill a mentoring mindset. You write down recurring answers 
and that in turn creates passive documentation. So essentially, you give contributors the sense that they can master new skills, but you also give the project the autonomy to define their own process. What about growing team members? That's easy. Mentoring is built in. So soft skills are being made visible by moving towards a written channel. You level up by mentoring others. Um, you reward people with more influence onto the project. And you're being motivated to praise people in public because this is your most important currency. What about spreading values? How does InnoSource help with spreading values? Well, every cultural change that you make is being made visible because you make it in writing and you use the same processes that you use in order to make software changes. You give teams autonomy over details on how they work, even though you may still have or you should still have shared values. And you allow input for those changes. How about communicating goals? That's easy. You do have a README document. You focus on a very clear mission per each project, so you have a clear goal. You can make the roadmap for each project clear. You can write it down. You can use it as a communication basis with um, downstream contributors who can send Jim in in order to change the roadmap. You have direct team-to-team -team communication with contributors moving to an InnoSoft project making contributions there. Plus, you leave space for creative planning. What about contribution overload? You, contribute, you communicate at a project level, no longer at a person-to-person -person level. That makes it much more scalable because everyone can watch, everyone can answer, and everyone can provide their expertise in order to solve problems. For dependencies, we've seen that we don't we find a middle path between cutting dependencies and waiting it out. We have a clear path towards collaboration, and we lift everyone by working together. Plus, by defining roles like trusted committer and contributor, we have clear and explicit accountability. We know who's responsible, we know who is the one who sets the rules and the house rules, but we also know who's allowed to participate. So in summary, InnoSource is not a silver bullet. It's an existing framework. Um, you can Your existing framework works like HL will still remain relevant. It's a toolbox that you can use. And what I would like to you to do is to check out the InnoSource Commons Foundation, the learning path and the patterns collection, and I would also like to invite you to share your patterns. So essentially, InnoSource is one step on a journey. It's trained more humans in open source practices, and that means lowering the barrier to get involved upstream. And after all, that's all that every one of us wants because it means that we can move faster.